Hi everyone, I'm Christy Dallaire, the director for the Pick Museum of Anthropology at Northern Illinois University. And it's my pleasure tonight to welcome you to the virtual opening for Hateful Things. Uh, this is a traveling exhibit from Ferris State University and their um, Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia. Uh, so this exhibit was brought to NIU through a collaboration between the Pick Museum and the Center for Black Studies, and we also received funding from the Friends of the NIU Library, so we definitely want to thank them for that. This is a really difficult exhibit, and we want visitors to be aware that throughout the exhibit they will be encountering, as the title suggests, hateful things, extremely hateful things, including racial slurs, difficult imagery, depictions of violence against black bodies. But it's because it was such a difficult exhibit that we felt it was important to bring to NIU. Um, and the, the Pick Museum of Anthropology's mis mission was recently adopted to be, in part, uh, to inspire activism for social justice. So we're doing this by address, addressing the legacy of racism and colonialism in museums, including ours. And we also wanna do this by building collaborations with community members who are already doing the good work of uh, creating positive social change. So we're hopeful that this is just the first of many collaborations with the Center for Black Studies. I also want to thank tonight a lot of people that helped make this exhibit possible. So don't mind me as I have to read off a couple names. At the Center for Black Studies, we definitely want to thank our partners that were involved the entire time working with us tirelessly to come up with the content that's in this exhibit. Dr. Joseph Flynn, Associate Director for Academic Affairs and at the Center and uh, Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction. Ann Edwards, director of the Center for Black Studies, and uh, the two students that were also working at the center that have uh, been involved in this process, Logan Andrews, undergraduate student worker and that has also interned at uh, Creative Services, and Galen uh, Rivers, who's actually a graduate assistant, uh, and also Christopher Mitchell, who is the assistant director for the center and will be filming a longer virtual tour that will be available later on in a couple weeks. Also, Fred Barnhart, <laughs> who is the Dean of the University Libraries, and he has been supportive of this project from the very beginning, um, advocating for it. Um, and for putting this exhibit together, it involved a lot of people uh, for the installation and preparation, so I'm gonna list some of those as well. Uh, Emily Corrigan, who's currently filming this, is our graduate assistant at the museum and always so eager to help in everything and very talented and capable. Um, and Paul Voss, who helped install objects and other preparation work. Uh, Sophia Varpados, who is the graphic design manager in the Office of Creative Services and helped us with uh, many of the uh, supplementary interpretive panels and other advertising material designs. And finally, my intense gratitude for Rochelle Wilson, who is the curator for the Pick Museum of Anthropology. And she's been involved in this process from the very beginning and without her, this would not be possible. So I'm gonna turn it over to her now so she can introduce herself and the process for putting this exhibit together. Thanks. So, hello, and um, thank you, Christy, for that. Um, Christy has also been instrumental in creating this. She does not give herself enough credit. Um, so thank you, Christy, as well. Um, I do wanna talk about bringing hateful things to NIU. Um, this has been a long project to bring this exhibit here. Um, this exhibit is a traveling exhibit from the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Paraphernalia in Big Rapids, Michigan at Ferris State University. This exhibit is incredibly popular, and it was actually first noticed by Dr. Joe Flynn from here at NIU, and he reached out to the museum and said, hey, I found this exhibit. I think it would be a really great opportunity. And this was two years ago that he reached out to me and said, hey, do you think that we can bring it here? And so I looked into it and I said, I think this is you know, a wonderful exhibit. We definitely want to bring it here. And it took us two years to arrange for this exhibit to get here because of how popular it is. 
So we feel incredibly lucky to bring this exhibit here. And I, I mean, in the time that it has taken to come here, so much has happened across our country that um, continues to show, as Christy said, why we need exhibits like this, why we need to continue talking about these issues. So I, I really wanna thank Joe for bringing this to our attention. And I wanna thank Anne and everyone else at the Center for Black Studies for getting on board for this um, and bringing this here for us um, and finding a way to do that. And I also want to send a huge thank you to the founder and curator and director of the Jim Crow Museum of Racist Paraphernalia, Dr. David Pilgrim. Dr. Pilgrim actually started uh, collecting racist memorabilia back in the 70s in Alabama. Um, he grew up towards the end of the Jim Crow era and he started collecting these things um, initially to get them off of you know, the market, off, out of thrift stores, out of garage sales. And eventually he began to realize that this was a story, these were objects that were telling a story and it was worthwhile to develop a museum. And luckily for him, Ferris State felt the exact same way. And in 1996, they started to develop the collections of the Jim Crow Museum and it has grown into the fantastic institution that you see at that um, university today. And so we are so lucky to be able to have this here and Thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that Dr. Pilgrim has done over the years. Um, with this particular exhibit, some of the things that you will notice is that we do have the interpretation from Ferris State University. This is what Dr. Pilgrim worked on as well as his staff to develop this exhibit. Um, in this exhibit, the Center for Black Studies and the Pick Museum of Anthropology staff got together and we started to notice some different themes that were popping out in the materials that you see here. And as a result of that, we actually were able to develop supplementary interpretive panels, which are the ones that you see here. Um, Dr. Flynn and Anne worked on these, and they actually tell the story about how we have interpreted these objects, how we have organized these objects into different themes. And those themes do include hateful household things, hateful children's things, hateful media, fatal hate, hateful advertisement, and hateful daily indignities. And so as you walk through, we have actually, the museum here at the Pick Museum and the Center for Black Studies have divided this a little bit differently than uh, Ferris State had initially planned it out, but we do have their interpretation alongside our supplementary interpretation um, that expands a little bit on exactly what the mission and what Ferris State and Jim Crow Museum had initially envisioned for it. We were also incredibly lucky to have two incredible donors that, uh, well, loaners, who loaned us objects in addition to the exhibit. Uh, we have a beautiful tablecloth that you will be able to see on Joe's tour in a little bit that did come from an anonymous donor. And we also, in our five front windows, we have a collection of various figurines, uh, most iconically, uh, Mammy figurines that were loaned to us by Miss Brenda Applewhite. And we want to just thank those donors so much for bringing those objects to us and giving those objects to us and allowing us to put them on display and interpret them alongside of this exhibit because they have added so much to what we're already doing here and really helped us to tell another side of the story. And so with that, um, again, I just want to thank everybody for joining in with us tonight. Um, the Center for Black Studies, Joe, everybody that has been so supportive of this, the uh, NIU, the Friends of the NIU Library, we really couldn't have done this without you. And so with that, I would like to turn this over to Anne Edwards. Good evening. My name is Anne Edwards and I serve as the director of the Center for Black Studies here at NIU. And we are celebrating our 50th year um, of, of service to the NIU and local community. We're so excited to co-sponsor such a thought-provoking exhibit. And I just, I wanna take a minute, minute to, to really shout out um, how colleagues work together. And so a really good friend of mine, Lakeisha Jackson, who works in the graduate school, she, it was her mother that actually had the collection of Mannix. And so to literally be able to reach out and, and, and connect, I, I just wanted to, to, to say how we work in collaboration across campus to bring these types of um, exhibits to NIU. 
we hope to just really create dialogue around the exhibit. And we hope that that dialogue um, leads to learning. I want to just thank our individual sponsored donors for um, who gave money and resources to help us to bring this to NIU. I also want to have a, a give a special thank you to the staff of the Pick Museum who work late nights and long days and um, followed up with us many, many times to make sure that the, the things that needed to get done were done and made this a really beautiful endeavor. We are also happy to have with us um, Dr. Laverne Guyant, who she's an associate professor, but I always call her the uh, Director Emeritus of the Center for Black Studies. Um, Dr. Brinkman, the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, and Dr. Lloyd Ellis Piper, the Dean of um, the College of Education, as well as Provost Ingram here with us to, to tour the, the um, exhibit. And with that being said, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome the president of Northern Illinois University, Dr. Lisa Freeman. Good evening, Huskies. I am so proud to be here to be part of this virtual opening of the Hateful Things exhibition. And I also want to express my gratitude to the curators of the exhibit, to our colleagues at the Center for Black Studies, at the Friends of the NIU Libraries, and the students, all of whom helped bring us this opportunity for enlightenment and dialogue. This exhibit sets context for the work our university community is doing to dismantle systems and structures that are racist or that um, foment inequity. The objects, the images, the narratives here showcase hate and ignorance and pain. But they also call upon us to look hard and look differently at our society, at our community, and in our own hearts to see where we need real change. And we are committed to real and meaningful change. And that can't happen unless we acknowledge the pain of the past. To promote racial understanding and healing, and to strengthen the foundation for our community of the future, a community that is caring and welcoming. I want to encourage everybody who's watching to make an appointment to see hateful things in person, firsthand, to take it all in, to talk to others about it, and to encourage friends and family members to do likewise. And now it is my extreme pleasure to introduce NIU's Vice President for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, our Chief Diversity Officer, and Interim Chief Human Resources Officer, Dr. Vernice edgehill walden Good evening. Thank you, President Freeman. Again, I want to thank everyone that has taken the time to bring this exhibit here. You've heard about all of the sponsors that have participated in allowing us to be able to bring this exhibit. So again, I say thank you. I just wanted to offer a few words before uh, we continued on in the program. One of my favorite uh, authors um, and activists is Brian Stevenson, who actually we brought to NIU a few years ago, the author of Just Mercy. And he says, the greatest evil of American slavery was not involuntary servitude, but rather the narrative of racial differences we created to legitimize slavery. Because we never dealt with evil, with that evil, I don't think slavery ended in 1865, it just evolved. The evolution of slavery, as Stevenson speaks of, is evidence, I believe, in this exhibit of hateful things. Our collective past must be understood, acknowledged, and reconciled for our healing as a nation, as a country, as a city, and even as a campus for us to move forward. 
this exhibit, I believe, can help us on that journey towards healing. I challenge everyone to not be afraid to view the exhibit through the lens of understanding and to learn how systems of oppression are really used even today. Understanding the historical and deep-rooted racism and anti-blackness and it is, its use to continue generations of racial myths, stereotypes, practices, thoughts, and actions is something that we need to really consider. It's a cycle of hate that still exists today. Visiting the exhibit, I want you to challenge your thoughts and understanding of our history. Think about some ways that you, in your own environment, community, can make a change and dismantle the racism and the anti-blackness that still exists today. Try to stop that cycle of hate. Reconciliation and healing is important and it is a very long process and can be very painful as we get through healing, but it is absolutely necessary. Please enjoy the exhibit and continue to think about ways that you can stop that cycle of hate. Thank you. No, I'm good. <laughs> Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Joseph Flynn. I am the Associate Director for Academic Affairs for the Center for Black Studies and Associate Professor of Curriculum and Instruction here at Northern Illinois University. Uh, before I begin, I want to also express my thanks to uh, the Jim Crow Museum for Racist Memorabilia. I want to thank uh, the Pick Museum uh, staff, um, the uh, friends of the NIU Libraries, and of course, uh, my family at the Center for Black Studies. I greatly appreciate the support that everyone has given in bringing this uh, exhibit to fruition. Uh, I also have to thank uh, President Lisa Freeman. She is always um, supportive and engaged with the work that we try to bring, uh, as well as Dr. Beth Ingram, our provost, and my deans, Yes, deans, I have two. <laughs> uh, the dean of the College of Education, uh, Dr. Lori Ellis Piper, as well as the dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, Dr. Robert Brinkman. Uh, thank you all for coming out tonight. Uh, I greatly appreciate it. And for all of you that are logged in and watching online, uh, we, I thank you as well. So, Okay, now is where it gets hard. <laughs> the introductions and thank yous were easy, but uh, I, I've thought a lot over the last few weeks about um, you know, important things like tone and pacing and whether or not to slip in a joke here and there, but as we started to unpack these artifacts, that a soul-crushing feeling uh, draped over me. And in thinking about and, and seeing these images, it kind of leaves you with the question of why did they do this to us? And, and I have to use language like that because although practically every uh, minoritized group uh, here in the United States as well as around the planet are caricatured and stereotyped. But arguably, none has been more caricatured and stereotyped than African Americans and Africans. And this exhibit proves it. Um, one fact that we did not share in the introductions was the Fair Estate exhibit has over 9,000 items in their collection. 9,000. These images are from seemingly antiquity, such as from the days of slavery. But as you look at these objects, you might think that this is old and gone, but what you will find is that some of this persists to this very day. Now, before we begin, I'd like to ask you to think about when you wake up in the morning, 
and you look at yourself in the mirror and you see who you are, your features, your hair, your skin tone, uh, the smoothness of your skin, etc., etc. Then you go downstairs and you open a magazine. And the image that is supposed to be of you looks absolutely nothing like you. It doesn't matter if you were a sanitation worker or a doctor. These were the images that you saw repeatedly of yourself that not only cast you as less than human or ugly or dangerous or scary or exotic, but also cast you as this less than human. That's what this history is. And because of that history, African Americans are in a regular fight to preserve and promote more accurate representations of our humanity. So let's start over here. Now you're gonna, oh yeah, there's one more thing that I need to tell you. Uh, as Christy had pointed out, there are some very uncomfortable things uh, in this exhibit. Um, and I've thought a lot about this also, but throughout the exhibit, you will be exposed to uh, racist language and racist terminology. I am going to actually use the words only when connected to an item or an artifact and not gratuitously. The reason that I'm doing that, as despite how uncomfortable the N-word can make people feel, I feel it's important to preserve the authenticity of the object, to preserve that sense of hate, that sense, that feeling that you get when you see it. And therefore, uh, from time to time, you will hear the N-word. So please be warned. Now, <clears throat> the history of racist caricatures um, is a very long history, predating even uh, modern advertising. But of all the images that we know of, probably the most iconic is the classic Mammy figure. Now the Mammy, uh, seen here, um, was often uh, overweight, often oversized, dark skin, super dark skinned black woman, uh, typically a maid and always featured as uh, happy to take care of her white owners or uh, white employers. Um, this was an idealized um, sensibility about the role of black women in American society, not for a couple of years, not just during the time of slavery, but well even into today, and we will return to that in a moment. But I just wanna make sure that people see that these objects are span the uh, gamut of use from knickknacks that you can just put on a table or a mantle above the fire to banks that you can save money in. <clears throat> now, the Mammy image was seen in practically every household uh, object that you could think of. Uh, salt shakers, refrigerator magnets, calendars, posters, brooms, on and on and on. So this was the principal way in which particularly older black women were represented in media and popular culture for well over a century. Please follow me. Now, the first three panels that you see uh, are corralled under the theme of hateful advertising. Now, I think we oftentimes don't give advertising the credit that it deserves. Advertisement is meant to play on your feelings, play on your experiences and your ideas to encourage you to buy a product. So, <clears throat> playing off the mammy image, this first image we have here is probably also one of the most popular images that we can think of. This is Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima um, originally appeared in 1875 as Aunt Sally. Um, but by the time uh, you get to 1893, ex-slave Nancy uh, 
ex-slave Nancy Green's promotion of Charles Rutt's pancake mix at the World Columbia, oh, I'm sorry, Columbia's exhibition in Chicago birthed the Aunt Jemima figure. So Aunt Jemima was not just a made-up image. Aunt Jemima was a real human being who never really got any of the credit that she deserved, nor did she get the kind of compensation that she deserved. So <laughs> when we look at when we're you know, in the grocery store and we're going to buy our favorite pancake mix and we see this image, even though this image has now been updated, um, that image comes from somewhere and tells a much larger story. Now, because of the protest from last summer, uh, Aunt Jemima has decided to get rid of this image and is in the process of creating a new image. Hopefully, it is not an image based on real life human beings. <clears throat> Next, we have Coon Chicken Inn. Coon Chicken Inn was a small but successful fast food chain um, in the West in the uh, 1920s through about the 1950s. Now the thing that's interesting about this, and uh, could you come in really close? Mm -hmm. The stores, uh, to this image right here, the stores, <clears throat> um, to get inside, you actually had to walk through the so-called coon's mouth, right? Now, this image, um, you know, the company went out of business in the 1950s. Um, but with that being said, these images were plastered all over the West uh, as part of their advertisement. And as you can see, um, this is an image of a stereotypical black character that was born out of blackface, uh, the blackface tradition, which I'll talk about in a moment. But with the supersized lips and the reddening of the lips, these exaggerated features, um, this was meant to both dehumanize African Americans while also playing to the proclivities and taste of predominantly white audiences. So this was uh, an example of um, iconography used to sell fried chicken, which the store in and of itself called coon chicken. So <laughs> when we're talking about racism, we're not simply, t I, I cannot say this enough, we're not simply talking about people being treated poorly. We're talking about an entire social system that supported the representation and treatment of a certain group of people in wholly, grossly negative ways. <clears throat> now this is Uncle Rastus. Uncle Rastus was the advertising mascot for Cream of Wheat, and he was created by Emory Mapes in 1893. Uh, and he is what we call the Uncle Tom figure. Uncle Toms were typically smiling characters, wide-eyed, dark-skinned, and were happy to serve uh, white masters and white patrons or customers or um, whomever. Now, um, this image, too, has fallen out of favor. Uh, this was also an image that was repeatedly updated throughout the 1900s uh, and into um, uh, the 2000s. And like Aunt Jemima last summer, the uh, makers of Prima Wheat, uh, Prima Wheat have decided to get rid of this stereotype and put it to bed. Now we're moving on to hateful media. And <laughs> media is challenging because it's supposed to be a representation of our world, our reality. But one of the things that you see here, um, this is an interesting uh, array of objects. First and foremost, to kind of set the context for this, is up here is an honorary uh, Ku Klux Klan um, membership card, <clears throat> um, circa 1950. Um, below that is a 45, uh, for those of you who uh, were born after 1990, <laughs> a 45 was a single record. Uh, you can call it a download now. Um, but this song, um, 
is called Cajun Ku Klux Klan by Johnny Rubble. And I don't know the lyrics, and for some odd reason, I feel like I don't want to. Uh, but also underneath that is a, a pocket knife uh, that was distributed to uh, Klan members. Now, <clears throat> these songs, uh, these racist songs, are not, were not new to uh, the 1950s. In fact, racist songs can go all the way back into the time of slavery and have been reproduced again and again and again. And if you think that this is old and, and, and antique, the reality was is that at around 1920, uh, the number of Ku Klux Klan members uh, exceeded about 2 million people. Uh, today, uh, it's less than 20,000. However, the problem is, is that we're no longer dealing with the Ku Klux Klan. We're dealing with a number of loosely affiliated um, uh, uh, white supremacist or anti-black organizations. Um, and they also have their own recording studios and are continuing to put out this kind of uh, racist song, these kinds of racist songs, even today. Uh, you can download them right now. So I don't, I'm not going to tell you where, because I'm not going to promote it that way. But yes, they still exist, and they still have an incredible amount of power in how people are represented, seen, and heard or not heard. Now, <clears throat> probably one of the most painful aspects of uh, Jim Crow and uh, the history of American media is blackface. Now, it seems to me that about every Halloween, uh, there are a rash of stories across the country about someone that has decided to dress in blackface for Halloween. Uh, one of the most recent stories I saw was of a teacher who decided to dress in blackface. The teacher was ultimately fired, as I understand, and for good reason. But this is real, right? Um, when I saw this artifact, and saw this tube of uh, black grease paint that's used to darken um, the performer's skin uh, and to see the indenture that somebody used this, right? Now, for those of you that are not familiar with blackface, don't understand it, blackface was a tradition of minstrelsy that began in the 1840s. And, um, <clears throat> and proliferated throughout the United States in minstrel shows uh, on the vaudeville stage well into the 1950s. Uh, even in mid-century 1900s, you had church groups, um, high schools, um, um, theater groups uh, reproducing uh, minstrel shows, also using blackface. Now, we also know that blackface began to fall out of favor uh, once uh, motion pictures began uh, the talkie era in the 1920s. Um, once that happened, uh, the there was a desire to no longer use uh, white actors dressed in blackface and begin to use actual black actors. Um, now, a strange twist to all this is that minstrel shows were designed specifically to lampoon and disrespect uh, um, and misrepresent African Americans. But if you were an African-American performer, you still had to darken your skin, don a wig, and go out and lampoon your own community and culture in order to work your craft. And I think it's important that we hang on that notion of working your craft. Because black actors um, throughout much of American history have been systematically marginalized into particular roles. Now, there are always people who are pushing back on those roles. For instance, uh, in film, you had the great Oscar Micheaux and many other black um, filmmakers who were telling more robust and more complex stories about the African-American experience. But most of Hollywood for its entire history has been controlled by white folks who also controlled the, the roles that African-Americans were uh, offered in both film and television, also on the stage and um, in radio. So these images, this, this tool, uh, this idea of blackface, 
was a powerful, powerful tool in shaping the ways in which the nation saw African Americans. Now this is a poster from the, uh, uh, from the World's Fair. <clears throat> and something that we have to recognize is that um, World Fairs were particularly racist. <laughs> Um, Africans and African Americans were featured in uh, many of these exhibits as oddities or curiosities to come and gawk at, really. Um, probably one of the most famous was a pygmy um, named uh, Otabenga. Now, Otabenga was um, a, a proud African. Uh, he was brought to the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me, my notes. Uh, he was brought to the United States uh, by a missionary named Samuel Phillips Werner and displayed at the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. Now, putting a human being on display is one thing, but here's where it gets really messed up, if that wasn't already. In 1906, uh, Otabengu was moved from the World's Fair to the Bronx Zoo. The Bronx Zoo, right? And while at the Bronx Zoo, he was housed with orangutans. So a human being was featured next to, you know, an orangutan. So, and this was not necessarily seen as a problem. Now, of course, there were folks uh, that resisted and protested against that practice. However, it it was real and it happened. And so when we, again, when we start thinking about the images of African Americans and how we've been represented historically, that is a painful stop along that, along that road. And this wasn't just about Obenga uh, alone. Um, there was a gentleman named Zip the Pinhead who was an African American man who was born uh, with a tapered head. And um, Barnum, uh, P.T. Barnum of, um, uh, Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey Circus, he hired um, uh, 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 Zip the Pinhead as an oddity. And he was used for decades in the Barnum crew. So uh, oftentimes being constructed as the missing link or the man monkey. <clears throat> but what you see here uh, when you look at the image is this gross caricature of uh, African-American features, particularly in this case, the lips. Um, again, these were objects were designed to dehumanize African-Americans and quote unquote, put them in their place. Uh, and that place was typically um, below white Americans in the social hierarchy. <clears throat> Now, this part of the exhibit falls under the theme of hateful, childhood, of hateful children's things. Um, this is especially hard because these objects were created specifically for children, for the most part. Uh, we can go over here. Um, this was a comical card game, as it's described, called Attaboy. Um, I'm not entirely sure of how the game was played, but what I can tell you is that what you see on each of these cards are images of white folks, of black folks, and of animals. And all the white folks are depicted as noble, as um, civilized, as intelligent, etc., while the African Americans are particularly are seen as lazy, stupid, weird. Um, grossly dehumanized, such as this mammy white mother. <clears throat> and so as children play with these games, and this game uh, comes from circa 1930, as children played with these games, they were kind of reinstilling within themselves uh, the normalcy of the denigration of African Americans. Next here, 
Um, these are paper masks that come from about 1950s. And these were often used, you know, uh, as play, um, not necessarily Halloween costumes. Um, so these were for daily use. Um, and again, they are depicting African Americans as um, grossly subhuman, um, as savage, um, as something undesirable, as something that's dangerous. Um, all of that within one child's toy. <clears throat> now, as I said at the introduction, um, these things aren't, you know, limited to antiquity. This is Getopoli. This is a spoof on the game Monopoly, of course. Uh, <laughs> but according to its creator, uh, David Chang, who was a, Ta uh, a Taiwanese immigrant, um, in 2000, he created this game after watching uh, music videos on MTV and BET, particularly rap music videos. So he took, um, uh, he tried to take a satirical look at these images and creates this game. Um, as <laughs> when I know of all the things that I kind of laugh at in this exhibit, this is the one that I do laugh at because the absurdity is is just so far off the rails. It's uh, kind of hard not to laugh. But you can look, think about. I mean, many of you I'm sure have played the game Monopoly, so you can look at the the squares and uh, see how. Um, these stereotypes and images have been appropriated on the Monopoly playboard. So for example, uh, for those of you out there, the railroads have been substituted with liquor stores, as you can see right here. Um, Park Place and Boardwalk have been substituted with Malcolm X Avenue and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Also, the pieces are uh, uh, an AK-47, uh, a pot leaf, and uh, a basketball instead of a shoe, an iron, or a car. So again, it's reproducing these stereotypical assumptions about African Americans in the African American community. Um, now, of course, in 2003, Hasbro, the owners of uh, Monopoly, sued Chang for copyright infringement. Chang apparently countersued uh, and unfortunately, this game is still available. Um, I won't tell you where, because I'm not going to promote it, but it is out there. So these racist images and uh, stereotypes and um, representations are not new, and they are not done. <clears throat> now this game, uh, circa 1930, was a common game. And in which um, basically you just threw a ball and got a point. But most importantly, I want folks to think about how is this character character constructed? What message does that send about particularly black children and how we and how we can engage black children? See a part, and we'll see this again in a moment, but a part of this is when you dehumanize people. When you dehumanize them, you can do anything you want to to them. So this might just be seen as an innocent game, but a part of this game is to hit the character on the nose where you win a thousand points. So over time, one can get used to random violence against people of color. Now, children's, facial children's things were not limited simply to board games and throwing games or tossing games. Uh, you also have <clears throat> books. Now, although there were hundreds and hundreds of books um, that constructed African Americans in uh, less than human ways, one of the most popular is the Little Black Sambo uh, series of books. Um, <clears throat> Take a close up of that, thank you. Little Black Sambo was debuted in 1898 by a lady named Helen Bannerman. Um, there, 
it's arguable, it's arguable about whether or not the original um, book by Bannerman was meant to be a racist text. However, we do know that there were many knockoffs that came out after that, and they were increasingly racist. Um, so although many people who are still alive today grew up on the Little Black Sambo books, uh, <laughs> Dr. Giant just raised her hand. <laughs> Although, actually, a lot of people are nodding their heads right now. But um, these books were patently racist in the ways in which the, um, the little Black Sambo character was represented and was meant to be the avatar for all little Black kids. Um, oh, can we go around here before we do that? So this is Ten Little Niggers. Now, this book was written, the story rather, was written by Frank Green in 1869, uh, so right after the close of slavery. And um, the book was so popular, uh, it also appeared in Mother Goose's fairy tales. So this is a very, very popular story. Now, one thing that I found out um, through uh, bringing this exhibit here that really hurt my heart I'm a fan of Agatha Christie, and I never realized that her um, famous novel, um, And Then There Were None, was originally titled Ten Little Niggers. Uh, the title was reappropriated to Ten Little Indians uh, later in mid-century 1900s. So unfortunately, even some of my favorite people can slip into this. I don't want to take too much time here, but this next part of the exhibit is called Fatal Hate, and this is about lynching. Um, you know, I've lived almost 50 years, I've never actually seen a noose, so when we <laughs> unpacked this, I saw it and my eyes just kind of like, wow, that's a real live noose. And I, I was uh, talking to uh, uh, Christy and Rochelle as, we were, as they were unpacking the materials, and I just, you know, just out loud uh, in a thought moment said, who learns to, who sits down and learns how to tie a noose in the first place? You know, how does that happen? You know, why does it happen? But um, the, the exhibit uh, has this corner dedicated specifically to the victims of lynchings. Um, and lynching was a practice that um, no one really knows when lynching started, but we know that the lynching era began in about 1880 and lasted to about the mid-1960s, early to mid-1960s. Uh, we know that there is no anti-federal, uh, anti-lynching, there's no federal anti-lynching law, sorry about that. And we know uh, through the work of Brian Stevenson, who was mentioned earlier, and the uh, equity, is the Equal Justice Initiative, I'm sorry. Um, we know through their great research that well over 4,000 African Americans and others were lynched uh, during that period, oftentimes for violations of no crime at all, just allegations of committing a crime or a slight against a, um, a white citizen. Um, and we also know that most of the people who committed lynchings or participated in lynchings were never brought to justice. And one thing you have to understand about lynching is that lynchings were so common that in many places, they became public spectacle. In other words, people would gather together in town squares uh, to watch a black man being burned alive and hung. And what's even most grotesque about that is that after the body was immolated and the, or, uh, the person was uh, dead, um, viewers of the, um, of the lynching would take souvenirs body parts, fingers, thumbs, feet, legs, heads, and other more private body parts as well. So lynching was no joke, and uh, I think we as a nation should take every moment possible to respect and celebrate the people whose lives were taken in such horrific ways. Uh, now for the last, um, I'm not going to show everything in this uh, part. This is the Hateful Daily Indignities. And we wanted to call this section Hateful Daily Indignities because we wanted people to recognize that these images and these kinds of products were everywhere throughout society. One I really appreciate is this. It's called alligator bait. Now, many people may not know this, 
but through most of the late 1800s, well into the mid 1900s, black children were oftentimes depicted um, in the mouths of alligators. They were seen as alligator bait. And it, pro it projected this message that it was okay to kill black children. It was okay to throw them into the wild because they were wild anyway, right? So this, um, and we haven't really been able to exactly figure out what this is, but what we assume is that it was a toy in which when, <laughs> when you activated it, this is the head of a little black child on a stick and it goes into the alligator's mouth as it chews. So these images and messages were not just for adults, they were also targeted toward children as well. Um, no niggers, no Jews, no dogs. Uh, these signs were hung out, not hung up, not only in the South. And I cannot stress that this was not simply a Southern phenomenon. This was across the entire country, everywhere. You know, the Plessy versus uh, Ferguson decision uh, guaranteeing separate but equal was not simply a Southern phenomenon. It was national law. And many parts of the nation took part, and this is uh, proof positive of that. This is one thing that I think everybody who out there is watching should come in just for this alone. This is what's called a restrictive covenant. Technically, the restrictive covenant is right here. It basically is a deed for property that ultimately says that whoever is living in that property cannot or owns that property cannot rent or sell to an African American. So still to this day, that uh, history across the 1900s of system uh, systematically denying African Americans the ability to buy a home wherever they choose to, has uh, reverberations to this very moment. These signs were also political. I went all the way with LBJ, was uh, a, a sign that was created in the 1964 election. Um, uh, LBJ, Lyndon Maines Johnson, uh, used to say all the way with LBJ, and clearly some uh, opponents, to put it mildly, uh, created this sign. Connecting LBJ, of course, to what would later become known as the welfare queen. And this is another representation of African American women that is grossly uh, misrepresenting um, as being pregnant, as having hair up and rollers, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is kind of a spin to a certain degree off the Piccaninny figure, which I'll get to in a moment near the close. I'm proud that we have uh, one of these because um, throughout all this history, you have to understand that there were many people, uh, especially African Americans, who were resisting this uh, iconography. And we uh, know that this was um, a sign that was used during protest, um, claiming I am a man. I think it's really an important message. Now this, uh, Jim Crow kind of began to start falling out of favor and takes a lot of hits in the 1950s and the 1960s uh, as, a matter of, as a matter of law. You know, by 64 and 63, you have the Civil Rights Act of 64, Voting Rights Act of 65, and that kind of closes the Jim Crow era. Um, but that took a lot of fight. That took a lot of protest, took a lot of activism. And as we get to even the assassination of Martin Luther King, who in 1968, he was in Memphis, uh, working with uh, garbage workers. And garbage workers, uh, when they're strikes, um, they also use this I am a man sign uh, extensively. <clears throat> Follow me. That's the last thing. That's the creme de la creme. <laughs> now, these um, are ads, but I wanted to show you this. You're gonna have to get a close up of this. Um, these are swizzle sticks. For those of you that don't know what a swizzle stick is, because I didn't know what it was either, but they're, uh, they stir drinks. 
And these are black women of various ages, 15 um, to 40. And the way their bodies are, are carved, you can see here it says nifty at 15, spiffy at 20, sizzling at 25, uh, perky at 30, declining at 35, and droopy at 40. Even more of so, here there are numbers in the womb of the woman. So this on one hand is exoticizing black women while also caricaturing their bodies. I think I'll show you two more things and then we'll call it a day. Uh, give people a reason to come in. <clears throat> this is a running nigger target. Now, uh, these targets were, um, were distributed in the late 1960s, uh, and, and uh, many uh, folks would put them on their front, uh, in their front yards, on their front porch, um, boldly proclaiming that this was the official running nigger target. Now, uh, as you can see, this particular artifact um, has actual bullet holes and what's most frustrating about this, outside of the grotesque spatial features and, and body type, uh, is that apparently if you hit the head, that was the lowest points. The highest point were the feet. So a statement against uh, African American intelligence and uh, with giving um, more points to the feet, <laughs> not letting them get away. I want to end with this because I, when I first saw this, I was just floored. Uh, this is from an anonymous donor and it is a tablecloth circa 1950. Uh, as you can see uh, from the creases, it has been folded up for a while. According to the uh, donor who gave it to, who loaned it to us, didn't give it to us, who loaned it to us, um, she had found it from uh, in a garage sale in North Dakota uh, a handful of years back, and she decided to keep it um, for herself. Um, many of these kinds of objects over the last know, two or three decades now have been purchased by people with the express purpose of keeping them out of circulation. And uh, the lady who loaned us this uh, is one of those kinds of folks. So I do greatly appreciate her for that. But as you can see, this is a really, really well done uh, textile. Um, finely stitched. Um, and as you can see throughout the border are these images of African Americans uh, working the field uh, or the garden, uh, getting things prepared for supper. And of course, the black children sitting around uh, eating watermelon. So it plays on all these stereotypes and grossly mischaricatures of the ways in which African Americans look and uh, daily activities. So, with that said, uh, what? You turn that over to the show. Oh, all right, thank you. Nobody well, told me that part. <laughs> but. Um, <laughs> I want to uh, strongly encourage everyone to come out. Uh, I think being in this space and seeing this um, is, is particularly powerful. I really greatly appreciate everyone for listening. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Christy. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Michelle. <laughs> So, I, again, I want to reiterate, thank you to everybody that joined us tonight and gave opening remarks. Thank you to Joe for that amazing tour. Um, and we do want to reiterate that this is free. So if you want to come, go online to our Eventbrite, Eventbrite page and get your free time-ticketed reservation to come in and see this. We are seeing slots fill up very quickly. So make sure you get on soon and reserve your time to come and see this. We're super excited to share it with you. As Joe said, this tour, what you see on the video, just can't even describe these objects as well as being in this space and seeing them. So thank you all for joining us tonight on our Facebook Live, and we are looking forward to seeing you here in person.